Hello and welcome to Small Talk, everyone. Well, today's guest is a, a record producer. He is also, um, let's see, a songwriter, as well as a mixer. Ladies and gentlemen, time to meet Douglas Romanov. Welcome to the show, Douglas. Hi, Nancy. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Uh, it's a pleasure. The first thing I want to ask you, something I'm not quite sure what it is, what is a mixer? A mixer is someone who takes all of the recorded pieces and puts them together and polishes them up. Oh, okay. Well, that, that makes sense now. <laughs> Thinking about mixing a salad, you know, same idea in a way, right? Well, sometimes uh, producers are not mixers, and so they will send all their stems, which is all the individual pieces, instruments, and voices, and, and such, and send them off to a mixer. The mixer will balance out all the different parts of the music and add some processing and polish it up. So, mm. so uh, those things that I mentioned, what did you do first? Well, first you write the songs. And then, and then you go into pre-production, and then you go into production, and then you go into post-production. And part of post-production is the mixing. So you write the songs, then uh, you green light which songs you're going to have on a, on a record. And after that, um, you're into recording sessions, and uh, you know, you're putting together the bed tracks, um, which are drums and bass and guitars and that sort of thing. And then right. that into synthesizers and mandolins and Toronto Symphony Orchestra and whatever else you're putting on the record, including the voices and the artists, and most important part. And once it's all done, then you edit it, you make sure there's no mistakes. Right. Tighten it all up. And then you mix it. When did you become a songwriter? Oh, I've been writing songs quite badly my whole life. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I started really songwriting professionally in earnest about 15 years ago. Okay. Um, I had already been producing records uh, full time since I was 24 years old, pretty young to be uh, in the mm. chair. Um, but I'd done it for a decade or maybe 15 years. And, you know, people hand the songs to you and your jobs to make them the best they can be. And I was I was polishing up and making, I think, um, really respectable and some award winning records. But I wasn't seeing the kind of chart success I wanted and realized it really comes back to the songs. So I started going to publishers and saying, okay, I've got a young artist here and uh, she's fabulous, uh, but we're looking for hit songs. And so they would send me songs and they were all pretty good, um, but they're never gonna send their A-list songs to me or my artists. They're always gonna keep them and hold them back for Celine Dion or Carrie Underwood or uh, Justin Bieber, right? right. So, um, so they send you their B pile or their C pile. And those are good songs. Um, but you don't own them and the artist is going to see any royalties on them because they're not their songs. Okay. So I decided I would start a, a process of creating song camps where I would put together songwriters along with me and the artist and write songs specifically for that artist. So the, the caliber of songs went through the roof um, and this uh, was because I was tapping into professional writers that had already had many hits. And they're in Los Angeles, they're in Nashville, some of them are in Stockholm, some of them are in Berlin um, or London. And I would create camps where we would do a song in the morning, a song in the afternoon, do it again, do it again, do it again, uh, and create a whole collection of much better songs. And then those songs we would go into production with. And it's night and day in terms of okay. how the records perform in the, in the market. All right. See, my daughter's helping me work on a song. Mm -hmm. It's called Spider Farts. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like it has. <laughs> I think it's going to be like uh, one hit wonder. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. But let's just say, you know, I mean, we're doing this for real. But if if um, at some point I like, get it all ready to, now where do we go? You know, it's written. Um, it's written. Somebody's singing it. You know, then we have to, have, uh, my friend, a musician in New Zealand would put the music to it. Then where do you go? Like, do, then do you go to a producer at that point? For the producer? Right. So if you're putting the tracks together already, let's say your friend who's putting some music together in New Zealand, that's probably, you'll get it to a point where we would call that a demo. Okay. Oh, yeah. I see. Okay. What the song is, you know, right. unless, yeah. unless that demo producer is an absolutely fabulous producer, in which case you might already have your tracks. <laughs> um, but usually I will take um, those as sort of an indicator of where the 
artist would like the song to go. Hmm. And then I will go into production in earnest by hiring professionals at a higher level to actually put the, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm just curious about, about that, that whole process, you know. So the jump from demo to, to master um, sometimes is a huge leap if you're yeah. just an iPhone recording to your producer and the producer has to envision everything. And okay. then sometimes it is um, kind of a minor leap because much of the demo work can be used in the master. Okay. It, it all depends on the artist and, and the you know sort of the level of songwriting. Yeah. 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 It's like baby writing uh, <laughs> for yeah. me. Um, right. Now, meantime, let's get back to you. Now, you're also uh, you're a, a participate in being a, a panelist at music conferences. Yes, I have spent a little bit of time as a bit of a side hustle. I've been hired to um, sort of explain what this music production process is. So I do uh, some conference workshops where I'll do something called Behind the Glass, which is an insider's look at record production. Okay. And in that, I will write a song with uh, the audience and we'll have a band on stage and we uh -huh. will, I'll record them right, you know, right there in front of the audience. And you can see a big screen with Pro Tools. You can see it all getting recorded and then how I'll edit it and move it around. And oh, so how cool. Create, create a fast track so people can kind of see, well, how does... When I hear the song on the radio, how did, how did that come to be? Well, this is kind of that. And it shows a little bit of what the role of the producer and the engineer mm. and the producers are. And then I do another one called, which I really like, called Top Liner Track Guy. Mm -hmm. um, in pop music and to some degree in hip hop and to another degree in the country, um, there is sometimes the track guy who creates, which can be a female or male, by the way, uh, neutral term, um, is the person that puts together kind of a music bed, which has chords and arrangements and has drums and synths and keys and sometimes guitars. And then the top liner is just a writer who will come in and write a lyric and a melody on top of that. So a lot of, a lot of tracks are started this way. And then by the time they go through multiple iterations, um, the, the track gets chopped up, the lyrics get moved around, and so you end up with um, a song that is the hit that you see that has like eight songwriters on. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen some of these new hit songs that have a dozen writers. How in the world did they get a dozen people? Yeah. Well, it's because it's going through multiple edits and uh, chucking it out and people get their hands on it. Right. Because most of us just see the finished product. So we don't know the process, right? That's right. Very good. Um, Okay, so uh, now hold on. What was I looking at? Um, <laughs> we were talking about workshops and, and, and yeah, yeah, and exactly, yeah, yeah. So I've done that at uh, I've done it at Country Music Awards. I've done it at the Junos. I've done it at uh, numerous universities in the United States and Canada. So. Cool. Uh, have you yourself produced your own songs? I produced many, many songs that I've written, um, but I write for other artists. Okay. My role is essentially to produce other artists. Right, but you're being you're you're mentioned in the credits, obviously, right? Yes, I mentioned as a writer, and then I'm mentioned as a producer and an engineer and certain things like that. Right, for sure. So, what is it that you like doing? Like, what is it about it that you enjoy? What do I like about the music business? Yeah, yeah. What is it that that really gets you you know going? You know why you keep doing it? Yeah. You know, it's uh, I'm. When I say something sarcastic, but really, if I if I'm going to be completely earnest and transparent, like I get out of bed every day with the hope that we can write a beautiful piece of music and then realize it in some recorded fashion. So, like that's the thing that I love to do the most. You know, right. I I feel the same pain as my artists who have to deal with Spotify numbers or how good their tracks are doing on Apple, where they're, they're getting added to playlists or um, I also feel for people that have to like constantly work TikTok and Instagram to try and create some sort of social media following because labels are not hiring uh, or signing any artists that don't have these big astronomical numbers. And sometimes they sign the artists that uh, have astronomical numbers because of some goofy thing they did on TikTok. They can't play an instrument. They can't do a live show. And this is what the labels have become on the major label side, which is kind of discouraging. I get out, of, I get up every day um, 
to try and write beautiful music that is inspiring. So, yeah. yeah. So have you ever had somebody come to you wanting to produce their song and you realize this, like, this is not a good song? Sure. <laughs> of course. So how how upfront are you? Do you have to be with them? Oh, I'm very upfront. Yeah. I, I, uh, I usually have to say, you know, I think there's some good ideas because mm -hmm. there, there are some good ideas. They're not as ex executed as well as they could be. So, you know, I'll be straightforward. I think you have some good ideas here, but we don't have a record yet. Or you might have two songs out of 10 that you thought was a record. Why don't we go into a writing process? Put a pin in those. If you're absolutely attached to those, we'll do them. But take a walk down this path with me and let's write some songs just to help calibrate your ears and your thinking as to what how songs work better you know no right. one uses them that's fine but inevitably when you start working with people that have just thought about the craft of writing what works what works better why you wouldn't do that why this word sounds like a um an idea not a lyric mm -hmm. what makes a better lyric that's a great line but i think it's verse two it's not a chorus lyric What's a chorus lyric? You know, and of course, this is all moving target stuff, right? right? Every song and every idea and every artist is different. Yes. But you're looking for empathetic songwriters, myself included as the principal producer writer, and then the other co-writers to come in and really serve the vision that the artist brings. And, you know, that's the, um, that's the opportunity that my process offers mm -hmm. uh, for those people that are just, you know, really rigid that these are their songs and, you know, God gave it to me yeah. that way. So, you know, and yeah, I do move on it. And sometimes I say, well, you know, yes, you know, once you hear it, you'll know why God wanted to get rid of it. You know, like um, if they're not good, they're not good. Um, yeah. Or if they're good, they might not be good enough. So it's highly competitive. There's over 100,000 songs uploaded to Spotify every day. Every day, wow. That means that the market is flooded with everybody with a laptop just spitting stuff out and uploading it, trying to get attention. Right. So your stuff has to be really better than good. So what about if somebody has uh, their song, they went, they have it, their their thought is a particular genre, maybe, maybe rap, whatever, you know, and you think, no, it's better as hip hop or, or whatever you want to, you know, yeah. do you have that kind of situation? So that's a, that's an artist identity question, um, more than a songwriting question, okay. like songs, but, but it's an excellent question. You know, where does this artist really live? You know, yeah. what is their, what are their greatest strengths? What are the most attractive, interesting, uh, uh compelling, sexy, um, you know, emotional, you know, gritty. Where's the thing that they do that is that you can build a career on? So that's part of my job is to help analyze and identify the strengths of the artist. And you know, sometimes they say, "Hey, put down the bassoon before somebody gets hurt." You know, yeah. um, it's great for one song that bassoon thing, but we can't make a whole album out of that unless you're intentionally trying to be a classical bassoonist mm -hmm. right so what about the opposite like somebody comes with a song you say oh my gosh this is going to be so fantastic well i mean this is what you hope for every day <laughs> yeah yeah you know if they have that then really the role of the producer is to get everything out of the way just move every in, in, impediment you know every obstacle just get it out of the way and let that artist just be who he is and who she is and just do their thing and provide them with what they need. Oh, I think you're like if they bring in their own band, for instance, but their band isn't great. Mm -hmm. They really do have that smash. It's like, well, that's the conversation to say your band can play it later. But if we're going to make the best record we can make, yeah. let's play the people who play for X, Y and Z who are who are just going to put it someplace deeper you know their right. toolbox is larger their experience is greater and they're just going to help make it everything it needs to be so that's usually what i would say in that situation is make sure that the artist has everything they need in terms of musicians in terms of recording experience um 
Should they be in a cabin in the woods making this record? Should they be at the flashy downtown studio in Toronto? Mm -hmm. Should it be in this cool, rootsy place in Nashville? Like wherever that is, you know, make that experience the best it can be for them to create that. And then, you know, you polish it up. And sometimes I'm surprised. The song that we thought was the smash was great and it performed well, yeah. but the sleeper song on the record blew up. <laughs> you, know, you just never really know. So all you can do is make great, great art. So, you know, fundamentally, when you're in that sort of sacred space of creating something awesome, mm -hmm. like think less about, well, what other people can think about this and what is A&R going to say and what's my manager going to say? Like just create something that's really true, true to you, um, that just sounds awesome. Just, you know, you, you go after the inspiration of it. And my job is to protect that and to like throw gasoline on that fire. And mm -hmm. then, you know, chips fall where they may. You get into post-production, you realize, yeah, oh, it's fantastic, but it's also four minutes long. We could probably tighten it up and get it down to 310. Now we have the possibility of pushing to radio, but, you know, four minutes, forget it. So there's ways to edit the inspiration later that still protects the spark. Right. So there has to be a, a, a certain lot of trust between you as the record producer and the person bringing you their their song, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I tried from the very beginning to, you know, just have a clear communication about what our goals are artistically. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're building a house, right? So how much does it cost? Okay, well, here are the costs and there's the breakdown of how we're going to spend that money. And if you want to change your mind, midstream and add you know an addition onto the back right. or affinity pool uh, you know it's going to cost more i have often said hey your your record costs this amount of money but it doesn't include the toronto symphony orchestra so you know if in the middle of you say you know what would be great doug would be if we could just get the toronto symphony orchestra in on this i'd say sure um so let me find out what that costs you know yeah. so um Everything is done transparently in terms of what the artistic process is, what the scheduling is, who the musicians are going to be, um, and also what hmm. costs are going to be, so that you know the artist is able to. You know, nobody likes surprises, me included. I need to know if I'm going to hire X that the money's in the bank in order to do that. So right. essentially, uh, the producer's role is kind of like a. It's both the architect and the contractor. You're hiring an architect to sort of build the building to your specifications with, and to bring a certain amount of creativity to that process. Right. But also as the general contractor to make sure, well, you know, the drywall was properly, you know, by the way, you can hear drywall because there's someone working next door. <laughs> they bang around. Um, you know, someone's going to make sure that all the trades, all, every aspect of it, whether it be editing or mixing or mastering, um, whether the trumpet player is competent or the fiddle player is competent you know just to make sure everything comes together properly and it sounds like your time has to be very flexible right yes it's built my schedule is built around um, artist schedules so if they're touring i might be doing some post-production on certain records okay. uh, when they are finished touring and they're in the studio with me then i'm into songwriting sessions or tracking sessions for them and so sometimes, when, again, sometimes it's easy. Right. So when you have somebody at your studio, what's the longest amount of time you've ever spent with somebody working on their, their what they brought you? Well, there is nothing good that happens after 12 hours. And I suggest an eight hour day is probably the, the length, you know, Yeah. including lunch. Like really yeah. uh, good work can be done in two hour chunks, you know, and uh, with breaks. And then you come back fresh and you do another break. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've also done sessions with some of the biggest artists in the world where they roll in with their posse at midnight or one o'clock in the morning. All my sessions with Justin Bieber started at 1 a.m. and went until 9 a.m. The same thing with Tyga sessions. So, you know, these hip hop artists, they're night owls. So, and that's partially because their shows start at 10 o'clock at night. You know, until, okay. 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, and then they want to come over to the studio and record for a while, and then they go out to the bars and hang out, and then they sleep from, you know, 9 o'clock until 4, and then start their day again. So it's just a night shift. Um, nothing, it, there's no comment on it. It just is what it is. Right, yeah. But I generally suggest an eight-hour day. Uh, 
um, is the longest you can you should be working on something because you'll take you'll need psychological breaks from the work so you can come back to it fresh. And actually, four hours is if you can break your day in half and do half days, mm -hmm. get more done. Yeah. If you come in fresh with a list of things that you want to do, and you and your producer agreed you're going to, you know, boxes you're going to check that day. Right. Very good. Yeah. So, how do people find you? If they, you know, I mean, anybody can look up record producer, but how would sure. they then find you? Well, they can find me at uh, douglasromano.com. Um, and, you know, I'm on socials and I've been in the business for 35 years. So, you know, I have some reputation and right. pretty much all my work comes through referral yeah. um, either from artists or from mixers or from master engineers or some labels or, you know, managers who work with artists will send another artist to me. That happens. That's generally how my work is put together. Mm -hmm. um, and then I try to make myself available at conferences. Like I'll be at Juno's and I'll be at CCMA's. Okay. But I work in country, so I'm at CCMA's. I work in pop and alternatives, so I'm at Juno's. Um, I've made a bunch of blues records, so sometimes I'll be at the Maple Blues Awards. You know. Right. Yeah. Try to make myself available, but um, generally, you know, I can do pretty cool. <laughs> great. Well, I think we covered everything. Oh well, great. Good. Yeah. This has been fun. Oh, good. Well, stay on camera. And to the audience, you've been listening to Douglas Romanoff. I'm going to include his website so you can look him up or just Google his name. He'll, it'll come up. I guarantee. All right. Because I've checked. I like Googling people now just for fun. Anyway, oh, okay. <laughs> thank you, everybody, for watching the show. I really hope you continue to do so. Take care, everyone. And peace out. Bye now. <laughs> Thanks, Douglas. That was really awesome. So uh, sure. As I said earlier on this, on September 16th and I'll, at four o'clock my time, and I'll send you the link. Okay. okay. And if you, if you ever want to be back on, just let me know. I'm more than happy. I love it when people come back on. And you're interior BC, is that right? Yes. I'm in Chilliwack, which is a uh, Fraser Valley, not the interior, yeah. not the interior. So that's the West coast. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, I used to live in Terrace. Oh, we did. Oh, cool. I did. I did five and a half years from grades three to grade eight so very formative years for me my father was a, a bank manager at scotia bank so uh -huh. they would move him around you know they do that with managers um and so it was calgary well it was um yellow knife and mm -hmm. calgary, and i was born in grand prairie um and then terrace back to calgary and then i you know, sort of pursued music which took me out um, to ontario right. but, uh, well I yeah. Was, yeah i was born in new brunswick but grew up in montreal and i lived in ontario you yeah. know then we came, finally came out here. So it's like fun being, you know, different places in Canada. It's a beautiful country, isn't it? It's is really beautiful. And the people, you know, basically the same everywhere, but they're friendlier in certain areas, much more friendly in certain areas. Anyway. And how long have you been in Chilliwack? Uh, since 1995. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you for the work you're doing for, for artists and for music and uh, all the best. It's always my pleasure. So thank you very much again for being on. I love it when people say yes. <laughs> anyway, have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.